everyone. This is Kristen with Ingram Spark. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, the webinar we're having today is How to Build Your Author Platform with Online Marketing and Social Media, featuring Sherry Stotch. And I will introduce Sherry in just a minute. There's a couple housekeeping um, items that I want to check off the list here before we get started. Uh, as always, we're going to be live tweeting during the event, so if you want to get involved with that, there's a little module on your preview screen where you can type in your tweets and it will automatically tweet them out so you don't even have to be on the Twitter platform. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them. We usually save uh, a bunch of them for the end, about 10 minutes until uh, the top of the hour is when we will ask the questions. And uh, there's a printable version of the presentation in case you want to print that out for after or maybe you already have printed it out for to take notes on. That would be in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. And there's also uh, Q&A is where you'll, you'll find that at the bottom, I believe. Sometimes they get moved around, but there is a module for Q&A, so you just open that up and that's where you type in your question. We're recording the webinar, so there's probably a 48-hour time period where they, um, the platform that we use takes the time to put it together, and then we will list that on our YouTube channel, and then you'll also get an email from us saying, here's your recording. And feel free to pass that along, share that with anyone you want, or uh, visit our YouTube channel and make any comments there. And then the last, last thing is uh, we're nearing the end of the year. We have today's webinar, and then we have another one in December. So um, we typically will do these monthly, and every month it's like a new expert. So uh, spread the word and, and join us every month if you can. Um, so that is all I have for items. And I would like to introduce uh, Sherry Stotch. She is our online marketing and social media guru expert, um, and she's been involved with publishing for over 33 years. Uh, she's the creator of When Writers Win, and without further ado, here she is to um, talk to you today about mar online marketing and social media. Thank you so much, Kristen, and thank you, as always, to the Ingram Spark Folks, I think you guys are doing just a phenomenal job getting authors out there in the right way with their words and especially providing, you know, all this support. You know, guys, take advantage of these great webinars that they do. I've been on several of them and there's there's always useful information and new stuff coming down the pike no matter how long you've been doing this. Um, yeah, I'm, it's not my first rodeo. I've been doing it for a while and I still pick up new and fresh stuff every single time. So definitely get on the schedule to, to take advantage of those. So uh, as Kristen said, yes, I, I created a company called Where Writers Win. Um, we work with uh, emerging authors, new authors, uh, predominantly independent authors, and uh, we do that in a number of ways. Our, our, kinda, our whole mission has been to help authors find readers, and however that looks to an author, and we do that in a number of ways. We get involved with uh, designing and or uh, improving and fixing uh, author websites so that they actually can communicate uh, with their readers. We do one-on-one -on -one author social media training. Uh, we do video book trailers. We have a subscription uh, platform that's called the Winner Circle. Uh, at the end of the call, I'll give you a, a code for that too so you can get a discount on that if you want in. Um, that gives you access to uh, live reviewers by genre, book reviewers and book bloggers, um, uh, live book clubs, indie bookstores. It kind of creates a one-stop shop for, for authors and for literary publicists to get in and drill down to what they need to promote their work and find readers. So that's what all this stuff is about. Um, when folks come to us, their biggest concern, of course, is, okay, I know how to write. I don't know how to market. Um, actually, you do know how to market because when you started on this project, when you embarked on your, your first book or whether it's your fifth book, you still, even in the back of your head, even though you might not know it, you have an audience in mind. Um, so the marketing part is just once you have that audience in mind, how are you going to drill down to find them? Nowadays, because of websites and all this online stuff, uh, social media platforms, um, advertising platforms, 
right up to and including Ingram Spark. All of that stuff is super easy for an author. Um, it, and it is way less expensive than it used to be to go through these processes of, of hiring a big team and, 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 and spending money advertising and things. So yes, it will take you some time. But again, we also want writers writing. So once you get past the curve of learning where you need to be and what's working for you, uh, then you can really, then you can get more into the, you know, get engaged, get back out, get back to writing. And we typically have authors, you know, engaging between 20 and 30 minutes, maybe 20 minutes in the morning, maybe 20 minutes in the afternoon, or a combination of those, and, and just kind of maintaining that process as it grows. So today we're going to talk about ingredients for your author website, um, about a lot about social networking uh, platforms, and some tips for you know posting content that's going to help you out and help you find that audience. And we'll give you a few fun uh, do's and don'ts too. So uh, five website ingredients. If you don't have an author website yet, uh, yes, we do them, but you know you don't necessarily have to use us. There are a lot of folks that that do them out there, or you can set one up very easily yourself. Uh, people come to, to us a lot and say, but do I really need an author website? Can I just do this on Facebook? Um, and, and I'm typically going to say no, uh, because nowadays, really, that author website, that's your calling card, your business card. And everything trickles down from there. So, you know, we tell people a lot of times, you know, look, Mark Zuckerberg has enough traffic. He's doing fine on his own on Facebook. Your job is to use sites like Facebook and Pinterest and Twitter and LinkedIn to drive people to your site where you control the message, where you can collect uh, the visitor's email address, and then communicate with them on a, mo a more personal basis because we know that a lot of this social stuff, there's a lot of noise going on around it. And so it's very, very important for you to have kind of that home base, that place where you're going to control that messaging, where you can collect email addresses, where you can post content about your books, about your reviews, about events you're going to, about your opinions, and about you. Uh, whether or not you realize it yet, as an author, you're a celebrity. That's why people go to book signings. They want your autograph. So even if you're not feeling like a celebrity yet, you kind of are, and uh, that website is the place where you kind of need to start with that. So five ingredients. The first one we're going to talk about is about you. This can include photos. Um, you can have an official, you know, like your book jacket photo, that's fine, but we also suggest some candid things. Again, these, these, if you like to ski, even if your book's not about skiing and you have a great shot of you on the slopes, go ahead and put that up on your website. It's about building these connections with your readers, and the more they feel connected to you personally, the more willing and they are to want to read your work and get to know you better through your work as well. Bio, um, we suggest uh, getting something kind of anecdotal in there versus encyclopedic. Um, tell readers about your passion with your bio. Tell them maybe what led you to write this, this recent book as part of your bio. Or tell them you never thought you could be a writer because. You know, there's lots of ways to go about this to make it a little bit more interesting and frankly to give readers a better sense of your voice, of your writing voice. Um, biography, biographical information, so-and-so was born at such-and-such, such, you know, in a small town. That, that can be useful in some cases. It's more important maybe on your CV or your resume. Less important in that actual narrative bio. We want a narrative. Let's show readers that you can tell a story. And this particular story is about you, okay? Doesn't have to include your whole life story, but just something that, that's going to get them feeling closer to you. Also, you know, hobbies, dreams, charities. Charities is a big one nowadays. I, you know, if you have a favorite charity, um, all the better if it does align with issues in your book. So an example, I have a, a literary fiction author uh, who has cows figuring, yes, cows, moo cows, figuring predominantly in her current book. And through that, she started connecting with other animal groups and animal rights groups. Um, she has aligned with some of them as charities for her work. So a portion of the proceeds of her sales um, go to fund those organizations. What that does in that aligning of your charities also gets you to people who have an affinity for that particular charity. So it can very quickly widen your audience. 
and also lets people know that you know you're trying to give something back in the process of being an author. So those things can be important as well. Um, the next big step to your author website, of course, are your words. So for your recent book, and typically we want people showing their most recent work on the front page of their website. Uh, I tell I tell authors a lot online reading. It's it's what we call drive by reading. You have mere seconds to capture their attention. So if they're going to happen past your site and they're not going to go to other pages right off the bat or they're in a hurry or they just happen to see a link and click on it, you definitely want that home page to be showing your most recent work, what you're, what you're currently selling. Look, there's nothing that sells a second book better than a first book, but start with, with promoting your most, your most recent work. Uh, you'll want to include a very brief synopsis. Again, think drive-by reading. This is more your back jacket copy, the same stuff that people would see if they're looking at your book at the description online or if they're walking through the bookstore and, and, and picking up books and looking at the back of them. Um, include the cover photo. Uh, a picture is worth a thousand words. That's, that's always true. And then if you have reviews, uh, definitely post those. We do suggest that uh, you have um, a section uh, for your ongoing reviews, a separate section in your in your work, but put the best one, two, or three right on the front page of your website, just as you've seen other books where maybe you'll see a really cool reviewer blurb on the front cover of a book, two or three more on the back cover, and then several more inside. Uh, keep that same thought in mind with your website. If you don't yet have reviews, if your book's not yet published, you can do blurbs on there. Find other authors who are willing to say something cool about your book uh, and get those quotes up there. Anything that can help you let other people know that, that this work has been vetted a little bit, that there's other people out there saying good things about it. That's not going to be their primary reason for a buy typically, but it does factor into about 30%. These days I hear through surveys being done of, of you know, fellow peer recommendations uh, can be useful. So, so don't leave home without them. Um, <clears throat> list build. So you know, I mentioned that earlier. List building is, is sort of the holy grail these days of online marketing. And the reason for that is, is because social media became really big. It was this big fat bubble and then it got so big that there is so much noise so many things going on, it's hard to capture a reader's intention, and they're very easily distracted. We're all very easily distracted by this. So the list build is where they can get to your website from that link on Facebook and Twitter and wherever else you're engaging. They can very quickly, by typing in their email address, sign up for your list, and hopefully you will incentivize that sign up because that's what will grow the list the fastest. And by incentivize, I mean offer them a white paper, maybe if you're nonfiction or if you're fiction, the first few sample chapters of your book, something to whet their appetite and engage them to, to trap that email, to get that email. <clears throat> Those emails uh, work 10 to 1 over social media engagement. So if you post a link on, on Facebook and 10 people uh, to buy your book and 10 people click on it, if, if you posted that same link to your email list and sent out an email, by the way, there's a great event going on this weekend, checking, check it out, and you sent to the same numbers of people, you would have 10 times the response via, via email, which is very, very important to have that. That's why it's important to have this website to be able to develop those lists. Um, <clears throat> And the incentives is really big. And once your incentive gets old, maybe you want to come up with other incentives. And it doesn't have to be book content, though we do suggest that. Most online marketers will tell you you can give up to 30% of your content away to drive a sale. Over that might be a little bit too much. Under that might be not quite enough. But if you get them hooked, then they will want to click that button that says, now let me read the rest. Okay. The other big item, and people hate it, a lot of authors initially hate this when I say it, but it doesn't have to be the, the scary thing that it is, is that blog, okay? So that blog or journal, that blog bit on your site, that's what uh, in the business we call keeps the site in motion, okay? There are a lot of things on your site that aren't going to change on a daily basis. Your reviews will change here and there as you add new reviews. 
but your bio isn't going to change every week. Certainly your contact is, information isn't going to change every week or your home page. But this blog is something where you can be putting up new content every week, whether you're opining on issues that are important to you or you're talking about things that you know your readers love or you just want to post photos and descriptions of cats. By the way, that's the number one shared thing on Facebook. Just know that, cats. If you, when in doubt, post a picture of a cat. But um, this is the place that the thing that keeps your site in motion, meaning whenever you post new content on your website and those search engine crawlers, Google and Yahoo, are around searching, they pick up that there's new content. It helps you get discovered. It drives your traffic. It drives your ranking. It drives your discoverability by readers. So it's important to have that fresh content on there. Now, again, blogs aren't the 12, 1,500-word flowery essays of you know a decade or more ago. Uh, as this becomes more and more driving space, uh, it's important that uh, you keep it shorter. So typically 350 to 700 words is more than sufficient. Once in a while, you'll have a subject that dictates that it needs to be long form, and that's okay if you have the kind of the type of readers that want to read long form. And if you think that you don't, sometimes it bears breaking that blog post into two parts, part one and part two. It gives you two weeks or two months or however often you're blogging of copy to get out there uh, and, let you, uh, and let you still keep it short and concise enough for your readers to get in and get out and feel like they didn't go down the rabbit hole on your site and maybe they don't want to come back next time because it's going to take up too much of their time. Okay? So it's, it's not just useful for you, but it's also a courtesy to your readers and building your readers. Um, as far as what to blog, the sky's the limit. And you know, some writers have taken to blogging the publishing process. Others uh, talk about um, uh, issues that are relevant so that uh, that author I told you about writing about animals, she writes a lot about animals and animal issues. I have historical fiction authors that blog uh, scenes from the cutting room floor. So fun facts about historical figures that they've uncovered that all obviously couldn't make it into the narrative of their historical fiction but are still fun, interesting things to share. Some authors share lists. Um, maybe if you're a vampire writer, you want to share a cool list of the other top 10 vampire books out there or other YA lists. Some authors contribute to helping their fellow authors and themselves by doing book reviews um, of, of other books in the genre in which they're writing. So there is no one right answer. The more creative and innovative that you can be to stand out in that space, the better. And again, what you blog and how you blog is going to be very, very dependent upon your audience. Uh, one of the most famous uh, author bloggers out there, uh, he's a sci-fi writer, his name is Chuck Wendig. He's out there pontificating all the time. He swears profusely, drops F-bombs at least once or twice every blog post. Um, I would not do that in my own blog post. I don't think that it would suit me or my readership. That's not who my readers are. But that's who his readers are, and he has a huge, huge following. So kind of know your readers and your market. Um, before you endeavor to, to jump in there and blog so that you're really appealing to them. Also, while we're talking about this drive-by reading, let me make one more mention, especially in blogging, but really anywhere on your website or your social media. Um, shorter paragraphs, so just like we talked about those shorter posts for the drive-by reading, you also want shorter paragraphs, break them up with, into chunks. Uh, you're going to write more newspaper-type paragraphs than literary paragraphs because big blocks of type turn people off. They tend to skim over those, especially online. So you always want to think in terms of shorter paragraphs, shorter sentences, shorter words. Make it as easy as possible for folks to get in and get involved and connect and engage with you. And then um, contact info, and I, I apologize, I have this number uh, this numbered wrong somehow because um, I guess I can't count. But so your contact info, um, Please don't ever put your home address online. Uh, that's going to come up when you have to provide a, a, a email address and a physical address uh, to, your, um, to your list building places like Constant Contact or MailChimp. Use a PO box, use a publisher's address, uh, use an office address that will let you 
please don't ever put your home information up there um, for obvious reasons. Same goes for home phones. Uh, but do allow as much interaction as you can. I am a big uh, anti-contact form person. Uh, if you have a contact form and you love that, that's wonderful. But also put an email address where folks can reach out to you because there are certain folks uh, like me and, and, frankly, a lot of people I know that hate the whole idea of a contact form. Uh, they feel like they're kind of going into cyberspace and never getting to anyone. Frankly, because they're often going into cyberspace and never getting to anyone, they've proved uh, dysfunctional in many, many cases, uh, no matter how good a contact form you think it is. So again, have an email address there and a business phone if you have one or a dedicated line uh, for those folks. And then allow site interaction. Um, encourage comments in your blog posts. Ask questions that folks can answer. Uh, ask them to weigh in with their opinions. That's really important, especially as you begin your author website and you really start to develop a following out there. It's going to get you searched more and you improve your ranking too. The more time people are spending on your site and the more people that are engaging with the site. So now we're going to leave websites a little bit and talk, to, talk uh, more, some more about successful social platforms. Here's the thing. That social media, again, is everyone says, okay, now I have this gorgeous website. It has all this fabulous stuff out there, and I'm blogging once a week, and my blogs are phenomenal. They should all be given writing awards. And that may very well be true, but how are we going to get them seen? And that's where the social comes into play. Uh, we're going to use those other platforms to drive people, again, back to your website where you control the messaging. Now, the first thing, of course, folks ask is, you know, which do I need to be on? Do I need to be on all of them? No, but you do need to be on some of them, and initially uh, you're going to want to open accounts up for most of them and get a feel for them and get to learn them. That's a big part of what we do with our one-on-one -on -one social media training is you know, to, to kind of get that learning curve down because I, I'll tell you what, the first thing every author who comes to us says is, okay, I'll do any of this. I don't want to do Twitter. And I totally understand that because I was you, and, and, I, and I get where you're coming from. I was one of those people, like many authors, who thought, you know, how can an author possibly conceive of conveying any sort of valuable message in 140 characters on Twitter? Um, well, number one, you can because you use links. And number two, folks do. And number three, that is, that is probably the fastest way you're going to find a lot of your readers. Because Twitter is a very, what we call, open platform. Unlike LinkedIn, where you have to prove a connection, or your website, where you have to prove, approve a comment, on Twitter you can follow and unfollow anybody, unless they've set their things to, to private, which most folks don't. So you can, again, back to the silly vampire example, but if you write vampire fiction, there's a lot of great vampire fiction out there, where are you going to go on Twitter? Well, obviously you're going to go to Anne Rice's page or you're going to go to Stephanie Meyer's page if you're writing to a younger uh, vampire fiction lover. And you're going to see who's following them. Why are they following them? Because they like this sort of work. You're going to follow some of those folks, and some of them, when they see that you've identified as that vampire author, they're going to follow you back because now you're giving them another outlet where they can read their favorite genre. So you're going to start with those other popular authors in your genre, search their followers, and also who they're following, who they think is of value. Uh, you can see anything. We call it stealing, but it's really borrowing. You can see anything that anybody writes about anything on Twitter. Very, very open source. You can also use search terms on Twitter. Uh, so if you're writing about a certain issue, um, you can search that issue or you can search that topic or you can search that, you know, if you're writing about cars, you know, you can search, you know, 1960s automobiles and you will find people talking about those things on Twitter. Very, very easy to find. Follow some of those folks, have some follow you back. Um, so that's my that's my kind of a soapbox for Twitter because uh, I really you will love it after you get to it, and it's going to lead you to other folks' websites too, where maybe there's an opportunity to um, to do a book signing or to get a review. Twitter also lets you build lists. There's a little gear wheel function next to that follow button where you can punch that, click on that little gear wheel, and put people on a list. So where writers win, we have a bunch of different lists built on Twitter. We have one for literary agents. 
so that you can see what they're tweeting about, which I can tell you is mostly about what they had for lunch. You can see what uh, book reviewers are talking about. We have a whole list of people tweeting book news. So you can go to those lists and see very quickly who's tweeting about what. Um, definitely go after those reviewers on Twitter as well. There's a lot of them. Uh, Goodreads, obviously a place where every, especially if you're fiction, every author needs to be. Goodreads is the Facebook uh, for readers. And the power in Goodreads, besides tricking out your Goodreads profile page with links to your website and your blog and a video book trailer if you have one of those, uh, any, kind of any of those things that you can do on your Amazon Author Central page, you can also do on your Goodreads page. But then Goodreads has the added a bonus of being able to search for groups uh, who are basically like online reading clubs. And there are groups for any kind of genre you can imagine and subdivisions of those genres. If you just want to read about World War II history, there are groups for those. Or World War I history or Civil War history or sci-fi fans or paranormal. There are tons of groups for each one. It's a place where you can start to join the groups and when you join the group, start following some of those folks. You don't want to barge in with the conversation uh, right away, like, here, look at me, come buy my book. It's, it's a more gentle form of communication. You want to start connecting with those folks, weigh in on the conversation where you can, and start building more connections. Um, I can all of this social media, I've done articles on this in the past, that social media is like a, a giant online cocktail party, okay? So just like a cocktail party, you walk in, you talk to a few people, you talk to a few more, you don't run, stand in the middle of the room and shout, I'm here, somebody bring me a drink. The advantage of the online cocktail party is we don't have to get dressed, we don't have to put on makeup, we don't have to put on clean clothes or shoes. We can do it right from the comfort of our own library or, or cozy spot on the couch and slowly start to build these connections. Um, Facebook, for obvious reasons, that's totally some people's audience. Google+, Plus, uh, less so more unless you're more kind of artistically or tech inclined. But still, we encourage people, at least initially, to also be posting things on Google+, Plus because guess what? Any link posted or, or post put up on Google+, Plus gets searched and indexed by, you guessed it, Google. So it is helpful to develop your initial traffic. Um, LinkedIn, very valuable if you're looking for speaking engagements, um, very valuable if you're looking to communicate with or speak to larger groups or organizations. If your book uh, appeals to women, you might want to search out women's groups. Uh, LinkedIn, like Goodreads, has a group for virtually everything, not necessarily for authors, but people interested in that space. Uh, and LinkedIn authors are very, very connected to their groups, and they tend to be very active, very engaged, because it is a more professional site, more than just a fun social site. Um, Pinterest is my absolute favorite to talk about, because Pinterest has surprised so many of us. And just a quick uh, anecdote, analogy, or anecdote to, to give you an idea of that, I, I was a huge fan of Pinterest when it first came out, just for myself, because I thought it was big fun. And then I came up four hours later and realized I wasn't going to get those four hours of my life back, and I got kind of aggravated. And I, I, I sort of, on the business side with authors with limited time, felt like, okay, it's probably not the right play for most of our clients. And I really felt this way unless you were, you know, a cookbook author or a children's book author, somebody who had a lot of graphic visual content uh, in their work, and I really wasn't recommending it too much. And then because I also attend a lot of webinars and seminars to keep up on all the new intel that's, that's coming out for, for the benefit of our authors, I was hearing a lot of, no, you have to be on Pinterest. It's getting searched as much as Google. Oh, Pinterest is amazing. It's wonderful. And still, I kind of turned a blind, blind eye to that. But lo and behold, one day I went into my, old, my own analytics, and that's another thing that you, that's useful with your author website. You can check your Google Analytics and see exactly where your traffic is coming from. And here I am posting every single day on Facebook and every day or retweeting something on Twitter. And I have very big audiences on both of those. I have a very tiny audience on Pinterest. I hadn't been there in probably four or five months. And yet for some very strange reason, I had more traffic coming to our Where Writers Win website than Facebook and Twitter combined. 
And at that point in time, when the numbers tell you that that's where people are coming from, you have to react to that. So we do a little bit more on Pinterest now. I still don't spend a lot of time there. But again, it consistently outranks everything else that's, that's pulling folks to our website. So people like to get in there. It's very easy to click through on links. So be mindful of that. Um, how do you do that as an author? Uh, we have some examples. You can search uh, in the search button near the bottom of our page on Where Writers Win. You can search the word Pinterest, and you'll see articles that we've done on it and examples of what other authors are doing. The most successful that I've seen are authors that are taking scenes from their book, finding either taking the photos themselves or finding scenes from those books online, and then uh, pinning those with a line from their book that takes place during that location, that geographic location, uh, or seen in their book, and matching them up and then having a link back to their site. It lets them get something visual out there, even if their book is not visual, and lets them tote a few lines from their book and then drive people back to their website, and they found that to be very successful. And then, of course, there are the other visual sites like Instagram. Some authors, uh, Laura McNeil is one. She does a great job doing different Instagram things out there and gets a lot of following that way. There are um, uh, Insta book uh, bookers right now, just like there are U uh, booktubers, people that post book reviews on YouTube. There are also people that create just gorgeous layouts and photos of you know a stack of books with the newest book they're reading on them. So search books on Instagram, and you'll see how a lot of reviewers are, are doing that to reach out to readers. And if they're doing that innovatively, that might be a reviewer that you want to connect with too. So it'll help you connect with those influencers, um, those reviewers and book bloggers that are, that are talking about the type of book that you write. So um, backtracking just a little bit. So why is it critical? Uh, social media, media is critical because it lets you connect directly with those readers and get that instant feedback. So um, we have a lot of uh, authors who use their social media to do cover contests. You know, the, the publisher's trying to decide between two covers, which do you like better? It lets those readers engage, and it gives you some intel that could be helpful for you. Um, authors have done that with words, too, just saying, you know, I, I'm doing this little bit, what do you think of this, or ideas. Um, it lets you build relationships in that fan base. Obviously, of course, uh, driving readers back to your website and building your email list, and of course, ultimately selling more books. Isn't that the name of the game? So engagement tips. Um, what we tell every new client when they get started with us is say, look, I want you to pick a number in your head. And your number can be 1, or it can be 3, or it can be 10, or it can be 20. Right now, my number, number typically hovers around 7. And that means at the end of every day, seven new people are going to know the name of our business or know my name. I'm going to connect directly with, with seven new people. How am I going to do that? Obviously, through social media, it's the quickest way. On those days where I have very little time, Twitter is the fastest way to build that following. I'll go to other websites or, excuse me, other Twitter uh, pages that are offering up uh, writer advice. I will retweet their stuff. Uh, because the more the merrier, and I will look at who's following those folks because those are obviously other people in need of writer advice, and I'll follow a number of them. Some days it might be connecting with the Goodreads gro writers groups or LinkedIn writers groups or Facebook writers groups. But again, uh, however you do it, um, it doesn't matter so much. It matters that you're doing something every day, and that takes a little bit of pressure off of you too. Um, to say, okay, God, I just don't have time to get into Facebook and Twitter and Google Plus today. You don't have to. You know, today you have 10 minutes. All right, jump on Facebook, see what those groups are up to. Um, take the pressure off of yourself. It's more important to pick a few things where you think your readers are and more closely connect with that. Um, best engagement content I want to talk about, um, especially this, this comes under both your blog and your social media posts. So think about us as humans, the things that we like to read. If I see a headline that says, I'm going to teach you every social media tip ever written, my wee brain cannot get my arms around that. So I'm going to get very tired very quickly, and I'm probably just going to blow past that post. Versus, even, even if it's not consciously, even if it's my subconscious brain saying, okay, i got to leave in 20 minutes, what do I have time for, right? 
that post that says three tips or five tips or nine ways is going to attract my attention. Every online marketer knows this, and that's why you'll see every post that you go to, especially advice posts, at least 75% of them are going to contain a number in them. Five ways to, six things you need to know, uh, five do's and don'ts, all those sorts of things. So think in terms of numbers. That's one way to attract readers. You know, five books in this genre that you definitely should be reading, or five things I wish I knew before I published my book. You know, any of those sorts of, if you're doing advice and or even entertainment, try and use those numbers. The other thing is um, asking a question of your reader. So uh, what do you think about this? Now, you can't ask, again, because subconsciously we're all in a time crunch, uh, so it's hard to ask, like, those really deep philosophical questions, maybe on a blog post occasionally, if, if those are the types of posts that you write, deep philosophical types of posts that demand those sorts of reflections, but more um, something that a reader knows right in their brain when they read the question, ooh, I have something to say about that, and I can say it really fast. Like, uh, what's the, the best sci-fi book you ever read? Boom, I can answer that really quick. Uh, or uh, what's, the, what's the coolest thing you learned in kindergarten? Whatever that is, asking that question encourages people to engage. We're humans, we have egos. All of a sudden, we know that an author asking us uh, this question, they must think that our opinion is valuable. That automatically brings us closer to our favorite authors. And then offering a provocative statement is also uh, a useful way to attract attention. Now, it can't be un outrageous or untrue. You know, you can't write a book about your five uh, favorite sci-fi uh, books and have the headlines say, you know, I saw Elvis last week, no for real. Uh, those don't work, but something that al aligns with your situation that allows you to ask that provocative question or make a provocative statement, um, again, provocative, meaning provoking provoking their thought, provoking their interest. Um, those are very, very useful ways to connect with people. And it doesn't just go for those blog headlines. It's that social media stuff, too. So if I just say, you really should go to this webinar at and provide the link, that's kind of, all right, number one, I'm telling them what to do. I don't know about you. I don't like being told what to do. It doesn't get me there. But, um, it, you know, it's more along the lines of, have you seen these cool top five social media t tips? You might want to check out this free webinar. You know, give them a reason to, to, to go and visit your site or to visit the link that you've provided to them. All right, social media do's and don'ts. These are always my favorite my favorite. We actually, in live discussions, we get into some pretty funny uh, discussions of these, but on the do side, I mean, it's pretty obvious stuff, but I'm going to tell you anyway. So, right, be authentic. If I'm not Chuck, Chuck Wendig, I'm not going to try and be Chuck Wendig. Yeah, he might have a big audience, but that's not going to work for me, is it? Um, respect your fans. Um, and that's very important in terms of both um, being kind, but also acknowledging them. So if somebody posts on your blog or your social media, typically it's very kind and thoughtful and, and frankly smart to use their names. Wendy, I'm so glad you mentioned that. Thanks for weighing in on that subject. People like to see their names in print. Again, we're humans. It's ego. Um, include photos, visuals. They've proven this over and over again. If you just put up a link and then side by side on a site with the exact same audience, you put up the exact same link but with a cool visual, it will, get, it will get clicked eight, nine, I don't know the exact numbers right now, but multiple times that link alone will. Again, pictures is worth a thousand words, and pictures get attention. And of course, w folks like Facebook know this, you know, and Google Plus, the algorithms are there where those are the things that are gonna show up on other people's timelines first. The things with cool photos or graphics or visuals or, or um, videos, especially videos nowadays. Um, share others' content. Again, like the cocktail party. So what do you do for a living? It isn't just about shouting about yourself. Ask other people's questions, but, but also share their content. The typical rule in marketing is uh, an uh, 8 out of 10 ratio. So 8 out of 10 posts that you make will be about other things that you see, and then 1 or 2 will be about yourself. By the way, if you like this, you might want to check out this link at... 
uh, and then give them a link back to your own site. But if you're talking about farm animals, maybe you're going to send them one day, you're going to shoot out a link to the farm sanctuary or a tweet that they've posted. Or if you're talking about other writers, you're going to shoot out links to those different sites. Uh, the more you share, the more people know that you're there to be social, you're less of a threat of somebody who's going to just be sending them a lot of spam, number one. Number two, they have uh, they realize that then they have a chance of having their own stuff shared, and it's all very symbiotic and kumbaya, and folks love that. And number three, you're going to make connections that way, too, just by when you show people that you're tweeting out their stuff, they're going to pay attention to your stuff more, too, and start tweeting or sharing your stuff on Facebook. So there are a number of reasons that it works, but it works in every single case. So be open to sharing lots of other stuff out there. What I do is I have a list of sites uh, that I think are kind of cool, and then I also use a program through Buffer to post things uh, where I've just set some algorithms, you know, post interesting things on social media, marketing, and that kind of thing. So even when I'm not around, that kind of stuff is, is being posted because I don't have every answer, but I know there's a lot of awesome sites out there that do, so let's arm authors with as much as they can find, and it's useful for everybody. On the don't side, please don't overwhelm yourself. I understand the temptation, especially even when you first get into Twitter and realize how useful it is. There's that tendency to go after the costco size, super-sized bag of M&Ms, just start with the snack size, set the timer if you must. I, I, frankly, I must sometimes on sites like Twitter and Pinterest where I know I'm going to go down the rabbit hole uh, and I don't want you coming back hating me that you just spent eight hours of your life on Twitter. So, you know, set the timer for 20 minutes. Jump in and jump back out. You, know, you don't need to dedicate your life to this. It's, it's little but consistent bits of, of working on this piece, just like it was little and consistent books that brought you to – or uh, bits that brought you to writing your book, right? You didn't get it all done in a day. You chopped it off chunk after chunk. The same exact thing goes with your overall social media goals. If you have a goal of 10,000 followers, that's great. You're not going to get them all in, in one day. Just you know, go after them slowly and build better connections. Uh, the better your connections, the more those people will also want to share your stuff with their audiences, and it will begin to grow exponentially. Don't, I think we kind of covered this in the do's, but you don't want to spam your readers, so not every post needs to be buy my book, check out my book on Amazon, see my sale on Amazon. I just did that event. Intersperse those with other things. If you're doing a signing at a bookstore, talk about your signing at the bookstore, but maybe also talk about other signings that have been at the bookstore or why you love this bookstore or the coolest, quietest, quietest corner of that bookstore. There are lots of things that, that you can do to say more about others and keep those conversations going. Um, especially, this comes especially on uh, sites like Twitter and Instagram, but more and more folks are using them on Facebook now too. Use those hashtags. Um, and a lot of folks don't understand what a hashtag is. It's simply a way of defining a bit of subject matter. So uh, if somebody hashtags Freaky Friday, then there'll be all kinds of weird, you know, maybe horror things or whatever, but they're using that hashtag. Or if they hashtag vampire fiction, then they know that what you're talking about in that particular tweet or even through that link is going to be about vampire fiction. What this does is it helps expand your audience because people go searching for certain hashtags of things, and you can find the most popular hashtags on Twitter. They'll give you the things that are t trending all the time, or you can just search. Uh, for hashtags related to your genre. So if you're writing, you know, best business book, uh, you can search that hashtag and up will come people who have tweeted about that particular thing. So if you tweet using a hashtag and somebody else is searching that hashtag, even though you're, they're not your followers yet, they're going to happen upon you because you're part of that community's conversation revolving around that hashtag. And then, of course, don't forget to spell check. This is the one, This is the one, well, there's two areas. I'm going to add one to the don'ts. We're going to talk a little bit because we've got a couple minutes' time to talk about um, trolls. You know, don't get involved with the trolls, the people that, that make snotty comments on your, on your site or on your social media. Uh, you, you typically won't win, you know, and people can disagree with you and you can say yes, uh, thank you for that opinion, Joe. I'm, I'm glad you, you know, I hadn't thought of that. I'm so glad you brought that to our attention. Answer them once. If they answer back, 
oh, well, great, I'm glad I was able to help. Well, then they genuinely had a differing opinion. If they answer back, well, you're stupid for not having thought of it, and by the way, I don't like your hair, that's kind of more of an Internet troll. Those are the folks you want to avoid. There is this overwhelming tendency to think that you can be more rational than them, rational, excuse me, than them and win the argument, and you won't. They're not rational, and they have a lot more time than you, so don't get involved. Um, but also, yes, please don't forget to spell check everything. Uh, there's a tendency for us to, because it's drive by reading, go really, really, really quick. But we're going to be held as authors to a higher standard than anybody else out there. And if your tweets or your blog posts are full of errors, you know, read them out loud, double check them, use a spell checker, use uh, Grammarly, uh, take advantage of these different tools. Because if you have a lot of spelling errors in there, uh, then your readers are going to assume that, that you're careless and that the carelessness might be in your writing too and maybe that's not something they want to plunk down 9.99 to read. Okay. And that's basically it. We're going to take some questions. I wanted to let you guys know you can find us, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. Um, we have a special Ingram Spark uh, landing page as well too uh, that Ingram Spark can provide to you. It's up on their website as well. Uh, or you can email me, Sherry, S-H-A-R-I, at writerswind.com. And please feel free to ask questions. We're happy to do 20-minute consults with folks. That's completely free. We're happy to send you to other resources. We really, really do. I have the coolest job on the planet. I get to work with authors. We really do want you to, uh, to have fun with this process and to engage that readership and, and have a good time. Um, and then, uh, again, just to wrap up on the final thoughts, uh, learn from others with their big audiences, provide interesting, valuable content. Please stay upbeat. Nobody wants to be a downer in the entertainment space. Yes, there will be issues here and there, but you know what I tell folks is they say, well, but this is a horrible issue. I have to write about it. Well, that's fine. But right, there is no problem without a suggested solution. So at least try to, if you're, if you're digging deep on those things, you know, offer up suggested solutions and offer up that input from others as well. Um, share other folks' content, and again, be patient. Be patient and have tons of fun with it. This should really be a fun thing for you. Now I'm going to turn it back over to Spark, folks, and let's jump in with any questions. Okay, thank you, Sherry. That was awesome. I have a oh, few questions you. for you to answer. Sure. Okay. Um, the first one was... Um, about blog frequency, so for a, a publisher, author, what's, what it, would you think is the ideal blog frequency? Yeah, that, you know, and that's an excellent question. And I have some blog, uh, some authors who blog once a week. I have others who blog every couple of weeks. Some only manage once a month. Some do daily. The more important, I mean, and if you could do daily and you want to do daily, have at it. Go for it. We used to blog three times. We used to blog every other day, actually. Then we dropped it down to three times a week. Now we only do once or twice a week because I felt like uh, our audience was getting a little bit overwhelmed. Okay, but you know, I let them know we're going to, you know, we're going to be blogging less and stuff. The problem with this online audience is it, they're fickle. So you know, if you start out blogging every day and they come to expect that, and then all of a sudden you disappear for a month, it's three times as hard to get that audience back if you've lost them. And, you know, I, I tell the anecdote of, you know, when we're when a, a lot of us were little girls, we got these diaries, and, you know, on January 1, we, wanted, we swore we were going to write in them every day, and by the third week, well, maybe only a couple times a week, and, and by March we couldn't even find the stupid diary. So, you know, it's the same kind of thing. Don't set yourself up to fail. It is much better, especially with the ease of today's blogging platforms. We typically use WordPress for for our folks. They're very search engine optimizable. You can pre-schedule a bunch of stuff in there. So if you have a free day, go ahead and throw up 10, 12 blog posts. You can schedule them out over the next three months or whatever. More important just to decide in advance how consistent you want the blog to be and what that consistency is going to look like to you and your audience. So to kind of follow up on that, Sherry, another question yeah. that we got was, is there particular days that are better to blog than others? You know, they they switch around. They switch around a lot, and it kind of depends on what space you're in. And, and I go through this all the time, and we've adjusted ours a few different times. So it used to be like Thursday was the cool blogging day uh, to, or to release blogs or emails. And then what happened is everybody knew that. <laughs> 
So they all started blogging on Thursday, and people got overwhelmed, so they tried to find an alternative day. Sunday became the next big blogging day because, oh, guess what? People are home. They have a little bit more free time on Sunday to read their blogs. That is still a big one, too. So, and, but that can change. So that's one of those things that, you know, right now we try to blog on Sundays, sometimes Tuesday, sometimes Thursday. But then if your blog ties in with, you know, manic, with certain hashtags, for example, if you go looking at those hashtags on Twitter every day of the week and you'll see, you know, Manic Monday or, you know, uh, Two for Tuesday or, or any of those things going on, if you write an inspirational kind of blog, you want to blog when you can take advantage of some of those things too. So I encourage folks to go Google searching and see what's going to work best for you. There, there, there are no hard and fast rules, and, and the hard and fast rules do change. Great. Um, so I know you kind of touched on this a little bit in, in your presentation. You mentioned mm -hmm. if you're on different social media channels, like put a timer on for 20 minutes or so, do you have any other suggestions on how authors can manage their time on social media? Yeah, the biggest thing that I suggest, again, once you learn them, and you're allowed to go down the rabbit hole a little bit as you're learning. You want that learning curve to kind of help you decide what's most valuable to you. And then, you know, if all things are equal and you're engaging on all of these things, checking those Google Analytics to see so again, if I go to Google Analytics and, and I'm posting equally on, on Pinterest and Facebook and Twitter and all my traffic is coming from Facebook, really how much time do I want to spend on Twitter? I'm not getting any people coming over from there, if, if that's my case. So some of that's going to be dictated by your traffic. Um, what we suggest is you start with one or two and feel good and comfortable with them before you add in others. And then we also suggest that you use an aggregate. And there are two different aggregate sites that I use right now. One is Buffer and one is Hootsuite. Now, you can use both and put different sites on them to still use the free versions to learn more about them. So Hootsuite lets you put up a number of different uh, – they'll let you only put up three platforms for free. But on the paid version, which I think is still sitting at like $9.99 a month, it is the best $10 a month that I spend. Because I have load, you know, I've put up my URL for my personal Facebook, my professional Facebook, my my personal Twitter, my professional Twitter, my personal LinkedIn, my professional LinkedIn. There'll be some things I want to post to all of those, and some place where I only want to post to a few, and I can pick and choose. <coughs> Excuse me, but it lets you post to everything from one central dashboard, so you don't have to log in and out of of every single site. That is the number one time saver, a, a site like Hootsuite. Buffer lets you do similar. Um, Hootsuite also, by the way, so they include uh, Facebook, Pinterest, uh, no, is it Pinterest? I think maybe Instagram, um, LinkedIn, Twitter. So it, there are a lot of different platforms, and you load them up all into one place so that you, and you can create just the kind of dashboard that you want to see. So if you only want to see people who have tweeted about you or, or mentioned you on Facebook or whatever, you can see those things or you can see conversations going along. Buffer is similar. Uh, Buffer lets you plug in like a predetermined schedule. So if you know that your readers are night owls and you want to be tweeting maybe once in the afternoon and, and a couple times in the evening and you want to hit Facebook folks in the afternoon and you want to hit Twitter you know, once in the morning, once at noon, once in the afternoon, once in the evening, which, by the way, you should, um, hit them multiple times because different people have different Twitter behaviors. And if you think that you're going to annoy somebody by doing that and somebody comes back to you and says, why, why did I see this four times? They're on Twitter too much. So I wouldn't concern yourself with that too much. Every Twitter expert will tell you post several times a day. But Buffer lets you schedule those out. It lets you predetermine that schedule so that whenever you put up anything up on Buffer, it just plugs that messaging into the next available time slots which also takes less of the, you know, decision-making out of our hands because we sit there, you know, frantically go, oh, gosh, when should I post this? And, and you know, even, even making those decisions, it's, it's a time suck. So it helps you with some of that. Great. Um, do we set up social media and website branding for us as the author or the book or in the name of the book? What are your, what are your thoughts on that? 
My thoughts are typically on that. If you have one book and you plan to be a one-hit wonder, and look, there's nothing wrong with that. Ask a lot of musicians. Uh, but if it, and it's just one book, then you can brand around that book. Absolutely. If you plan to have a number of books, either in the same genre or especially with varying genres and stuff, then you really want to brand as an author. Um, that doesn't mean that you can't also, at least in terms of your website, uh, have another um, link going in. So in other words, you establish your website as janejones.com, but your newest book is Why I Love Dogs. You can also buy that domain name for Why I Love Dogs and also have it pointing to your janejones.com website. So that kind of covers you know, getting a little bit of extra juice for the newest book that's out there. And then, you know, if that book, if you think that that's going to go viral or deserves a, con a conversation all its own, uh, you can also set that up, you know, if you want, as a separate Twitter account. What I caution people on, and I didn't used to believe this, but I, I talked to Porter Anderson a lot, who's a big pundit in the author social media space, is that people want to connect with people, not with brands or companies. So even though Where Writers Win is my bigger Twitter site and I spend more time there than on my personal uh, site, I also have that tagged in my Where Writers Win description. It also says at Sherry J. Stock in there. So people know if they'd rather connect with me personally, they can do that. So again, think in terms of connecting personally. And if you're, you plan to write one more book, another book, even if it's five years from now, I would still start branding now as an author. Great. We have just two more, Sherry. Um, I still think one of them you can probably answer pretty quickly, so I'll start with a longer one. Um, what are a couple of things that an author must do to launch a book for marketing it? Oh, um, you know, the thing that I didn't mention, I think, in the slides, too, is you know, develop your book club questions. That's something we've written about extensively. You can look it up on our site search book club questions. You'll get sites where there are plenty of examples of them, uh, of generic ones that you can use as starter dough. But that's one of the big things, especially if you're a fiction read. You know, Even if you don't end up being a huge book club pick, the important thing is to have that tab on your website and be able to link to that on social media once in a while that says, you know, I've developed you know, 10 new book club questions for you know, why I like dogs to facilitate your discussion. This, not only uh, sets you up as you know book club worthy, but there is that subliminal that yeah you know on your website oh look they have book club questions they must be a book that that people would like to discuss. There's that subliminal out there, and that's something that you want to put you know you have to pay attention to that back matter. Once the book is printed, of course, then it's too late. You can still put it on your website and social media and stuff, but if you're still in the pre-publication process. Pay attention to that front matter and back matter. Pay attention to trying to get blurbs from authors. Pay attention to building that platform. Um, you know, you know, a lot of authors say, well, I'm going to write the book first, and then once it's published, I'm going to start the author website, and then I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to do that. I, you need to be starting those things coincidentally or, you know, three to six months before you publish optimally because once that book comes out, you want that ready-made audience that you can that you can blast it out to. Well, we got we got one more in. So uh, the cool. next one that was in line was, what method do you use to get your blog list set up? And then they asked, um, is that FeedBurner? Uh, to get your blog uh, set up on to be on other blogs? Is that what they're asking? I don't. It just says to get your blog list set up. Maybe well, not. yeah, I mean, your blog's automatically going to, in our winner circle, we have a whole list of blog directories um, that we feel are valid, uh, and you do want to set up your blog, typically your blog address. I know your blog address, if it's, if it's a WordPress site, it's always going to be, you know, your blog name slash F as in Frank, E, E, D as in David, slash feed. So it would be Jane Jones, you know, HTTP colon slash slash janejones.com slash feed. And then wherever you can put that address, yeah, that's great. So there are lots of different sites where you can, you know, you can put in your list. Mostly when you set up a new site, at least through WordSite, you express, you, you're kind of searched by a lot of those sorts of places already, but you can set your, your site up on, you know, all top. And there's lots of different blog directories out there that 
I, I don't personally use blog directories myself, but they all have great traffic, and it does create more inbound links to your website from other sources. Um, most important, of course, is to have your, your uh, blog, your website, uh, feed URL listed on your Amazon author page and your Goodreads page. Okay, Sherry. We're about out of time, but we just got one in that I think is worthy of a quick answer. Um, sure. Uh, the asker says, I have an author website and publisher website. Which communication should come from the author and which should come from the publisher? Super fast. Uh, well, you know. really, I mean, yeah, that's, that's pretty easy. So the author website is going to be where you are going to communicate with your readers. Uh, the, the people who are ultimately read your book and the publisher. And I have another client actually going through this very thing right now, and he's trying to do both uh, from one site, and he's basically going to divide his blog postings into categories. So he has a site for the books that are out, including his, and then he has a site that appeals to authors who might be looking for a publisher, and those advice bits are separate too. Um, so, you know, anything that's going to relate to keywords surrounding your book to optimize for your book. So, again, if you're writing about dogs, dogs, dog food, dog leashes, any of those things, that's what you want to be saying on the author's site versus the publishing site, you know, publishing deadlines and uh, back matter and, and all those terms that, that relate to publishing. So that's that's kind of going to guide you, really. It's your Your audience... In all these cases, your audience is going to dictate what you do. You know, whether it's your author website or a publisher website or your social media, uh, you're, you, you know, just putting yourself, it's, it's really putting yourself in the shoes of, of that audience. If I'm going to a publisher website, what do I want to be able to find? What do I want to be able to see? You know, what, what, what do I want to hear that publisher saying to me versus uh, what my favorite authors are going to be saying to me? All right, and that is all that we have time for right now. Great. Um, Great. Sherry, uh, well, before I thank you and we wrap up here, I, I do want to say a couple more housekeeping things. If we didn't get to your question, um, we will be posting some of those questions on our YouTube channel in the comments section. So what we'll Great. do is we'll Great. have Sherry answer all the, email, uh, all the questions and then um, within like 76 hours, it'll be posted on our YouTube channel in the comments section of that video. Um, and then also, everyone that's registered and on the call today will get an email 48 hours after today with the recording in it too. So you can go back review or share it with anyone that you'd like to do. Um, so that's that's it for the housekeeping stuff. And Sherry, this was wonderful information. I think we had a lot of engagement, and so I think you helped a lot of people kind of formalize and wrap their head around what they should and shouldn't be doing with social media and digital marketing. Thank you. Thank you so yes. much. And, and gang, I forgot. Yes, I was going to give you the code. So if you do want to join the winner's circle, it's, it's very easy. It's VIP, very important person, right? VIPW20. Just use that code and that'll, that'll get you right in there. Or you can use uh, Ingram Sparks code, which is also on their website. Either one will get you there. It's Spark20. S P A R K twenty. That gets you twenty dollars off the first year. It's normally fifty nine ninety five for a year, so that makes it thirty nine ninety five for a full year to get in there. Um, but yeah, any other questions? I'm happy to put them on the the uh, the comments page. Uh, and then thank you, Kristen. As always, I love doing these webinars. I I I adore your webinar platform. You guys have a great web, webinar platform out there. Super user friendly for authors. We appreciate it. All right. Thank you, Sherry, so much, and thank you to everyone else for joining us today. We will catch you next month. Great. And everyone have a happy Thanksgiving. Yes. <laughs> All right. Take care.